It is an illness that has changed lives, its grip farther reaching than anyone can imagine. It's Lyme disease. Earlier this year, we shed a profound light on this very important issue. From the causes to the controversy over testing and treatment, as well as the personal stories of those trying to break free. But it's those personal voices which are now being heard with the power right at their fingertips in this ongoing fight against Lyme. Social media is an undeniable force, a means of expression and communication, a way to reach millions and connect as if your neighbors. It's a powerful platform for voices to be heard. I'm Teresa Priolo. For the next half hour, we will show you how social media has given a voice to those committed to making a difference, from advocacy and support to breakthroughs in medicine. And later, I sit down with reality TV star and Lyme patient turned advocate, Yolanda Hadid, about her ongoing battle with Lyme. But first, the overwhelming response to our original special Lyme and Reason, a special produced here in New York, but it has gained international attention. And it has made us realize that sometimes it's the little things that produce the biggest results. Everyone globally has access to social media. So that power and that ability to leapfrog and have access to all those different people means that there's going to be community around very specific topics, in this case, Lyme disease. You could call it platform with a purpose. Patients and advocates that have been affected by Lyme disease eager to make an impact in the fight against the illness. They're taking to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and a number of other social media outlets to not only raise awareness, but to force real change. I think when you have medical professionals and um, organizations that may potentially want to raise money, that they have the ability now to create an environment where people can talk about what they're experiencing and that's really powerful. We've all seen the influence this form of media can have. It was two years ago when the Ice Bucket Challenge became a viral sensation, raising record funds for ALS. <laughs> Working in a similar vein, five women came together to present the Lyme Disease Challenge, which has attracted such high-profile names as Dr. Oz and reality star and Lyme disease patient Yolanda Hadid. We also have given people with Lyme a sense of empowerment because many of us are home, our beds, and if we can get on the computer and send out a tweet or post something to Instagram or Facebook and spread information, spread awareness, then we're having an impact in the world and we could be saving a life. Social media is an important tool for people battling Lyme, but it's also important that we use it to tap into the Lyme community. We put our full special on YouTube, and the response that we received from people all over the world was really overwhelming. Most people got to us by way of Twitter, and here they tell us, you rock this, most grateful 27 years and counting for me. This person wrote to us, Lyme and Reason was great. Thank you for focusing on the silent epidemic and the suffering, both physical and mental, people endure. It wasn't just on Twitter. We also heard from people on Facebook as well, like this woman, Sunny, who wrote to us to say that she enjoyed our interviews. She's from Canada, and she wanted to share her journey. I think social media has been a real game changer. You know, we were doing surveys on a shing single piece of paper, waiting a year for 100 respondents 10 years ago. Today, we'll get 9,000 responses in a month. Lorraine Johnson, CEO of LymeDisease.org, knows firsthand the power of social media. In Massachusetts, the nonprofit worked closely with advocates by issuing an online petition that called for an override veto on a bill for long-term antibiotics for the illness. We were able to go back and forth with the community, and we, you know, we drew in you know, over 4,000 responses and letters to the legislators in Massachusetts from Massachusetts residents. So it was able to have a big impact in terms of how things played out at the end. The Massachusetts Senate voted 37 to 1 to override Governor Charlie Baker's veto. It is undeniable that social media has been a real change agent in the battle of Lyme. 
But social media experts and health experts warn, while there's a lot of information about Lyme available, patients especially need to be mindful of the information they find and the information they share. Social media is not going away. This is the new norm. And as physicians, we need to realize that and embrace that. However, what I'm encouraging patients to do is talking to their doctors and not taking uh, whatever information they get on the internet as face value and uh, doing it themselves. Next, a government employee shares her personal struggle on social media in the hopes of creating change. That and more when we come back. Lyme disease can lead to a sense of isolation and abandonment, hiding the way one feels to avoid criticism, while at the same time searching for answers. But one government official suffering from Lyme is sharing her story on her blog, and she says that's given her hope that better days are ahead. I was always doing something. I was out running, I was soccer mom, football season mom, you know, whatever mom I needed to be. I was always really active with my girlfriends. Girls' Night Out was, you know, some of the best times ever. Nicole Green had it all, a new marriage, a loving son, and a truly positive outlook on life. It would be 2001, though, when life took a different turn. I just started not feeling good, just kind of dragging. And then uh, I noticed my personality start to change. I was um, very hard on my son. My uh, husband at the time got to the point where he didn't want to be around me. And at a certain point, I didn't want to be around myself just for mood sake, you know, like, God, you know, you're just unbearable. Did you look uh, yeah. sick? Uh, no, absolutely not. I looked fine. I looked fabulous. Um, <laughs> but, but inside, I was falling apart. What followed was a six-year journey of different ailments, physical and mental symptoms, diagnoses, and treatments. It wasn't until 2007 when I woke up in a hotel room um, and couldn't move from the neck down. Uh, and. Honestly, I think a lot of people would have been really scared if they couldn't move from the neck down. When you say you couldn't move from the neck down, I mean, mm -hmm. is that an exaggeration of oh, any point? No. no, like you physically could not pick your arms off the bed? I could not lift my neck up off the pillow. Tests for everything from lupus to sickle cell came back negative. It was the tests for Lyme that proved to be the game changer. When those tests came back positive, uh, you know, I really didn't know what to do. I had never heard of Lyme disease. Um, they were like, when did you get bit by a tick? I was like, never been bit by a tick. And it was on my way home as I'm trying to kind of think when I remembered that I did. I had a tick in the back of my head the summer of 2001. A steady round of antibiotic therapy helped her on the road to recovery. But a recurrence of the disease five years later propelled Nicole to not only seek further treatment, but also to share her journey publicly. In her blog as deputy director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on women's health, she's been able to bring about a new level of awareness. I don't expect anything from anyone um, as far as, uh, you know, where I work, what I do, the people that, um, you know, work in some of the other agencies. I'd, I'd, I don't pretend to know why they do what they do, why they believe what they believe, and what has to happen for them to validate how I feel or the experiences that I've had. What I do hope and what I do feel is that the more information, the more people, the more interest that this disease is getting, the more pressure that these other offices, these other organizations, associations are going to feel and, and they're gonna to have to step up to the plate because this is very real. Next, the signs of suicide. A Lyme patient shares her courageous story when we return. Stay tuned.
One of the softest voices in the fight against Lyme is often the most destructive. So many patients battling with thoughts of depression and suicide, and often it is on social media where they find the support they so desperately need. I sat down with a doctor and a patient who shared her very personal story. Lyme disease is a multi-systemic disease. It affects the mind and the body. So we really need to treat not only the body, but the mind as well. There's no hiding from the physical effects of Lyme disease. The pain, the fatigue, the massive toll it takes on the body. People are debilitated to the point of having a quality of life that's comparable to uh, congestive heart failure patients. And the pain that people have is comparable to post-surgical pain. But it's the impact on mental health that presents yet another problem in the fight against Lyme. The disease itself, the spirochete bacteria, uh, one strain is Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, it, it infects the brain. So uh, some patients, about 40%, some Lyme specialists say, develop Lyme uh, encephalopathy uh, or called neuroborreliosis. Um, and one third of those patients get suicidal ideation alone. It was this dark path patient Eva Hoy would soon find herself traveling. Despite overcoming a previous bout with post-traumatic stress disorder, her experience with Lyme proved to be a much more difficult battle. When I got Lyme, I was actually doing very well and my life was okay. I had beautiful people in my family, my children, you know, everything was really good. And um, I was faced with these panic and anxiety attacks and I really was terrified that I was gonna kill myself. Eva remembers when it all came crashing down. Still to this day, it is a period in time she finds difficult to talk about. I called my mother, they came and picked me up. I couldn't stop crying for like hours and hours and hours and finally they called the doctor and they said take her to the ER. And the main reason why I couldn't stop crying was because I really thought I was gonna kill myself. And the thing is, I don't know how many people who kill themselves actually want to die. It's just that you want, you need to have an end to what you're going through and you don't know how to end it. And um, my sister and my daughter were with me and they, you know, this is a few years ago and I said, you know, I, I stood there and at one point I said, why is this happening to me? Because look at them, I have these beautiful people in my life and my sister was hugging me and kissing me. And Eva is now an advocate for others living with Lyme. And as she herself continues to live with the disease, she's also mindful of those around her. I had uh, so many people in my life that, you know, uh, gosh, if I ever did kill myself, it would devastate a lot of people, I know that. You know, not to say that I'm the greatest mom or anything, but you know. But you are somebody's mom. I am somebody's mom. I'm somebody's grandmother at this point, and I've been lucky for some of the things that have happened, and I do feel God has blessed me. If you're having thoughts of suicide, there's help available. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The call is free and confidential. We've also heard your voices as it relates to the issue of chronic Lyme. And as Sharon Crowley reports, health professionals are hard at work making advancements in medicine. Is this rewarding work for you? It is very rewarding work. There is definitely hope. Dr. Kim Lewis leads a Lyme disease research team at Northeastern University's Antimicrobial Discovery Center in Boston. Each year, about 300,000 people in the United States will get the tick-borne illness. The majority of those who will get Lyme disease will take a short round of antibiotics and within a few weeks feel better. But doctors say a number of patients will also develop long-term health problems, which some doctors call chronic Lyme and others describe as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, or PTLDS. We do not know what is the difference between those people who, who will or will not develop it. The symptoms of PTLDS, or chronic Lyme disease, can be debilitating. They develop uh, Lyme arthritis, uh, so that means their joints get swollen, painful, they cannot walk very well. Uh, they can develop neurological disorders where they have what they describe as a, you know, a foggy uh, mind. So the fogginess comes uh, into the brain, uh, the memory loss, uh, fatigue. Uh, it is uh, a complex of very uh, unpleasant uh, symptoms. And how long do these symptoms last? 
Uh, these symptoms can last for many years. It's that issue that brought Dr. Lewis and other researchers from all fields of science, medicine, and the environment together at a conference here in New York City at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. These experts are sharing what they're learning about fighting Lyme disease and its long-term side effects. Dr. Lewis and his team of researchers in Boston are trying to solve problems on several fronts. One thing that uh, we have been doing uh, is developing uh, better antibiotics. He also hopes within the next year or two, there will be a blood test available to determine if you get Lyme disease, if you will be among those likely to develop long-term problems. Knowing that would help doctors immediately prescribe a more aggressive antibiotic treatment. The really tough problem is, of course, what to do with people who already have PTLDS, that, the chronic form. It's challenging to treat uh, because we do not understand the nature of this post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. We do not know whether the pathogen is there or not there. We don't even have a, a, an answer to that seemingly simple question. Is there hope for people that are suffering with this chronic form of Lyme disease? Yes, uh, definitely. In fact, Dr. Lewis says he and his team are testing a mixture of drugs that are already on the market to see if they would also work for treating the long-term effects of Lyme disease. Lyme came within my uh, sphere of interest because it seemed like another chronic disease, but unlike those, it is much more difficult to understand and to treat so, so that, you know, that's a challenge. I mean, we like to work on, on tough problems. The harder the problem, the more interesting it is. Uh, so that's good for the patients. Next model, reality star, Lyme patient, advocate. How Real Housewives star Yolanda Hadid has dedicated her life toward finding a cure for the illness that has ravaged her life. When we come back. One of the biggest criticisms of Lyme patients is that they look healthy. No one knows that more than reality TV star Yolanda Hadid, who is in the process of rebuilding her life as she continues to fight for a clean bill of health. Yolanda talks candidly about life, Lyme, and where we go from here. It's undeniable. People can, you can, anybody can go around, say whatever they want, but the truth is the truth. The public image of Yolanda Hadid is one of sheer perfection. Tall, gorgeous, well-heeled, a successful model, a proud parent. But beneath that porcelain exterior, a battle rages, one often complicated by the image the world sees. You can look great on the outside, but dying on the inside. Do we need to look like we have broken bones, lose our hair because of, you know, treatments? I mean, that's not doesn't make it sound so ignorant to me. For the last five years, with and without Bravo's TV cameras rolling, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star has struggled with Lyme and its chronic debilitating effects, a disease that has ravaged her body and her mind. It has been an unexpected journey, and still, five years later, an uncertain future lies ahead. I truly feel today that this is my journey and I am not going to stop until I find a cure and I can heal, you know, my children and all the millions of teenagers that, that are suffering out in the world. Do you feel as if your celebrity has helped in facilitating a conversation about Lyme and Lyme awareness? I think I really awakened the conversation about, you know, chronic invisible diseases. It's not just Lyme. Today, Yolanda can confidently say her disease is in remission. And so now she's turning her attention to a cure. That my life is going to be like this, uh, you know, it is what it is. But for the teenagers, that's unacceptable. You know, we need to find a cure. These kids need to go out in the world and live the life that they deserve to live. Yolanda knows of what she speaks. Her children, Anwar and Bella, are both suffering from Lyme. How are your children doing today? Anwar is doing great. He's been on a protocol now for three years and we're probably 90% there, so thank God. And he's really serious about it. And Bella is, you know, struggling because it's harder to treat her because, you know, she's living 
the supermodel life all over the world. Like so many Lyme sufferers, Yolanda and her kids have found support on social media. On Instagram alone, she's followed by more than 2 million people, a community loyal as she shares her journey, one that's taken her around the world in search of the life she once knew. At the end of the day, you know, everybody's just lonely and, and people are looking for some sort of a community where they can just be understood. Like I always say, you know, you don't get it until you get it. And that's just the truth. If we've learned anything from these special reports, it's that Lyme sufferers come in all shapes and sizes and from every walk of life. In an instant, you can go from having it all to fighting through the daily fog and fatigue that takes over your body. The voices of those who are suffering and the voices of those who advocate for advances are what continues to push this conversation forward, both in person and online, raising awareness and affecting change. For that reason, we have posted this show and all of our interviews on our website, fox5ny.com. Thank you for joining us. And for all of us here at Fox 5, I'm Teresa Priolo. Goodbye.